Supercomputing and the Renaissance may seem to be an unlikely combination, but that's not the case at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Hi, I'm Michael Hakarainen, and welcome to the SD20 News Desk. My guest is Stanley Aholt, who directs RENCI. Dr. Aholt, what is RENCI, and what's the connection with the Renaissance? So RENCI is an organization that is um, overseen by the three large universities in the triangle. Uh, that's Duke, NC State, and, and UNC Chapel Hill. Turns out that the uh, the staff and faculty members that are associated with RENCI are all faculty, or I'm sorry, all uh, employed by UNC Chapel Hill, but we try to accelerate the research at um, all three of those large institutions, as well as institutions around the state, and we have lots of collaborations around the country. So the idea was to generate a renaissance in research by bringing supercomputing and, and modern data science to um, much of what uh, faculty and other institutes, uh, other institutions are doing here in, in, the, in the triangle. So the renaissance was meant to be a flowering of uh, additional research, and indeed that has really taken place. So a renaissance of research in the research triangle at North Carolina, I would assume there is a lot of work being done on the pandemic. Uh, why do you think supercomputing is so vital to our the future of our world during this time? So uh, to, it is an interesting question because uh, and, and knowing how we've gone about trying to solve uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as a bit more of an insider than I anticipated, being. Uh, and the reason I say is, as an insider is it turns out that the NIH work that we have been doing at RENCI has ended up um, very much focused on making sure that we're ready to accommodate the COVID-19 data as it becomes collected from various clinical trials and other studies around the nation, and in fact, actually internationally. And so, um, seeing how challenging it is to collect that data makes me even more appreciative of the fact that that data is critically important to figuring out solutions for the pandemic. Uh, as, as it turns out, I think the, the announcement yesterday of a possible vaccine that looks like it's very promising is a very interesting example of where computing and visualization and uh, all of these efforts that supercomputing has been at the forefront of for low these many 40 some years or longer um, in order to understand how to go about blocking the coronavirus from entering into the cells and so <clears throat> it really became a, a problem of or became a an issue of finding a molecule that binds to the appropriate portions of the the spikes on the COVID-19 virus in order to prevent its entry into cells at a, a rapid rate. So to me, it, it's uh, it's somewhat ironic in a very positive way that we happen to have the tools of modern science at our disposal in the f as we are confronted with this with this particular pandemic. Just imagine what it had been like had we been back in you know, 1918 with hardly any tools at our disposal and a, and a significantly less potent amount of science at our disposal. And we would have had this coronavirus uh, confronting us then. It would have been very, very challenging for mankind. No question. Uh, such tremendous leaps in science and, and research and in computing. And, and you mentioned, you know, what we would have had 100 years ago. But what have you seen with HPC in the world advance over just the last couple of decades? Oh, well, one thing that's just been a dramatic change is the uh, pervasive use of specialized computers, particularly GPUs, which largely became less expensive because of the gaming industry. But now you see us moving even more rapidly into even more specialized computers. And so there's no question that as we went from highly specialized supercomputers to supercomputers built from largely commodity products, the typical CPUs that you have in your laptop and the Beowulf and all of the, the cluster technology and the massive parallelism. And then we've switched back again to having these hybrid machines that have different types of CPUs and different types of GPUs. And in fact, even uh, you know floating point gate arrays and, and other specialty hardware that's meant to accommodate, you know, knowledge graphs, uh, you know, and, and all of the associated 
technology and algorithms necessary to take advantage of all the massive amounts of data that we're starting to collect. Not starting to anymore. Nowadays, we're, I think, inundated in data. You mentioned the, the power of supercomputing, but it seems like a lot of that power also comes from super collaboration and collaboration is key to the success of overcoming this pandemic. So can you tell us a little bit about NCDS and IRODS and at RENCI and how that's poised to address the global challenges that we're facing? Sure, so NCDS is and in, in the IRODS uh, consortium. So both of those are consortium. NCDS is the National Consortium for Data Science, and that was meant to be a forum where academics and industry could come together around the challenges that are presented from data science. And we do see, a, we've had a steady number of members of NCDS and regular meetings and some very interesting events that here in the Triangle as well as other places. We're seeing a, an increase of interest in joining the NCDS in order to start to marry supercomputing and data science. So I think that's um, an area that's poised to, to really take off as a consortium. The IRODS consortium, on the other hand, is not poised. It, 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 it is a large consortium. And if you've followed the IRODS story, IRODS is an integrated rule-oriented data system, and it is a software, open source software package that allows you to write policies that dictate how your data can be managed and accessed. And it turns out that's an incredibly important um, concept in data management. And so it, it, I think of those two vehicles, NCDS and IRODS, to be two different organizations, one of which talks about the organizational level and the relationships between the, the academy and industry, and the other which uh, is a consortium around an open source software package that's meant to help people deploy that software in order to manage their software. And if you um, are watching the membership of IRODS, it's grown and grown and grown steadily for the past five, six years. Um, yeah, the issue of collaboration is far more central to the way that we're conducting science than it has been in the past. And I think that that's one of the things that as our supercomputing moves more and more into cloud environments, in other words, environments that aren't on premise, um, we are seeing uh, a, another fundamental change in the way we're doing science, which is sharing the data and the compute cycles uh, among a, a consortium of people. And it's because of those people and the different expertise they bring to bear that we're able to solve these more complex problems. That is definitely a, ch a, a change that I think is in full swing and it's going to continue to increase over time. And that collaboration will continue at the SC conference as well. So oh, when all of these HP enthusiasts get together for the conference, what kind of discussions do you think will result? Oh, I think every time you're at supercomputing, in this case, we'll be at supercomputing in a virtual way. You run into people that you've known for many, many years, um, and you start talking about what you're doing and what's new, and suddenly you find areas of common interest and that spawns new collaborations and new opportunities to bring together new teams. Um, you also learn from your colleagues what they've learned how to do that you haven't learned how to do. And so lots of times it's a, it's a, it's a uh, insight gathering activity. Um, I always find the time I spent, uh, particularly on the floor, but also in the, in the sessions, the paper sessions and, and the discussions, the panel ses sessions, absolutely riveting. I, I can tell you that some of the most enjoyable times of my career have been at supercomputing and listening to really bright people talk about really complex problems. It makes you uh, appreciate how much fun science is. So that's an excellent perspective from someone who's attended the conference for several years. What kind of advice would you have for new attendees this year? Oh, uh, there's no question. Uh, my number one piece of advice is to go, to go to the plenary talks because they're usually spectacularly good. Um, you know, we, we, supercomputing does attract some extraordinarily good um, speakers. And so uh, I, I, I hardly recommend that. Um, the sessions are varied and they can be highly interesting. Uh, you know, different sessions can be very interesting to different people. But most of the time I spend at supercomputing, I spend on the floor walking around and I'm very methodical about how I walk around and visit the different booths and look at what they're doing and try to talk to people, particularly people that I haven't seen there before or new ideas so that I'm 
refreshed in the sense that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not missing this opportunity to be, to be stimulated and uh, educated by the people around me. So get out there and mingle. Some of those people out there around you, some of those people you'll be mingling with will be on the cusp of their career. And I noticed that uh, in your background, with your education, it doesn't only involve high performance computing, but also electrical engineering. So how's your knowledge of electronics to help you focus on computing? So being an electrical engineer gives you a deep appreciation for the simplicity of a thing like a transistor. It's just a, you know, a, a slab of material with a little bit of stuff mixed into one particular section of it. And with that, we can create these incredible devices like the smartphones in our pockets, as for example, just by putting billions and billions of these little tiny things called transistors together. And I think having that appreciation for what's at the root of our computing phenomena that we call supercomputing today, um, at least gives me an appreciation for how all the pieces come together. So I think I've been very fortunate to, to have taken a path in my career that has led me to understand the fundamentals in a way that I now can appreciate from a much more abstract position. I mean, nowadays, supercomputing doesn't, uh, not very many of us write code in assembler language, but, you know, there still are a few people. So just a personal philosophy question on computing. Do you believe that uh, the most complex problems are often solved best with the simplest of solutions, especially when it comes to coding? Um, what might be a very simple solution might be a very sophisticated solution. What I have found is that in many cases, um, getting significant speed up in code, for example, requires you to think about the problem differently and, and therefore lay it out into a different data structure or understand how to go about using the native uh, fast operations on a particular chip to its highest advantage. So I, I do think that in many cases, it's very simple things that prove to be extremely valuable in, in cracking hard, complex problems. Excellent. Well, we want to thank you for your time and your wisdom, but we also want to give you an opportunity. Are there any thank yous or kudos or shout outs that you'd like to express before we wrap up? Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all my colleagues at Renzi who have made Renzi the wonderful place it is to work every day. E even during the pandemic, we we have uh, Zoom meetings night and day, and, and uh, it's been a joy working with such wonderful people. But from su the supercomputing perspective, I do want to give a shout out to the to the committee. The, the committee at SC is always a group of people that selflessly work for the betterment of the in, the entire community. And you know, from the from the chairperson all the way down to all of the people who work on the on the floor, I just want to thank you all for the for the hard work you've done and making a pivot to having a virtual conference this year. I'm sure has been challenging and 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 stimulating at the same time. I'm sure, but I just want to thank everybody who has gone to. You know, lots of times they're giving of their own time and their own energy. And I just want to say thank you all, including you all. Okay, and Dr. Ayhelp, before I do any conclusion or anything, are there any questions you wish I would have asked in this interview that I haven't asked yet? So, so you know, I thought about before this interview, I thought about all of the plenary speakers that I've seen over the years, Alan Alda and, and, and uh, mm. uh, you know, uh, Oh, just just uh, you know, a number of people. Uh, Bill Gates is another that you know presented at one of our supercomputers, supercomputing meetings. Um, but I, I don't think I, you know I don't think of it as a highlight. I think of it as a series of really joyous meetings that have occurred over the years. It's just been fa fantastic. Sometimes those speakers are the ones who really revitalize your passion and remind you of like why you're doing it and help you see from a broader perspective. A absolutely. Like yeah, you're very. That's very true. Yeah. Um, one question I do want to ask, because you mentioned that the the committee has had to make this pivot to moving to a virtual environment. Do you have any predictions on what we'll learn from these virtual conferences that might be sticky and carry over into future conferences, even when we can meet face to face? Well, I I think that we have learned that we can do 
a better job than we anticipated by being in, in a remote setting. I mean, and again, I can't help but note that you can look at the phenomena of Zoom as a supercomputing success because in reality, there's thousands and thousands of servers running simultaneously across, you know, parallel streams in order to enable our, you know, our our world economy to keep going. Okay. So in some sense, Zoom is a is an incredible example of supercomputing. And so I think the ability to be able to function this way surprises all of us to some degree. I also think that there are certain um, unexpected side benefits that I, I think that um, we'll look back and go, wow, I, I, it's too bad it took a pandemic to realize this. Um, for one thing, I think lots of more people are cooking for themselves. <laughs> I think people are growing mm -hmm. more herbs and, and, some, and vegetables in their backyards. And I, I think that we've learned the incredible interdependence of, of all of us in a social fabric and how much we miss it because we can't do these large gatherings. And eat. But I am hoping that we'll appreciate being together even more. And hopefully that'll, uh, at least it's my particular hope that maybe this will help us heal after the rather challenging political times we've been through. Those are excellent and encouraging words. Uh, I, I think a lot of people subscribe to that same philosophy, which is we're not going to ever get back to normal. Instead, we're going to create a new and better normal. Mm -hmm. And do you believe that it, it might be better for our world to have thousands and thousands of servers running to get people to connect rather than thousands and thousands of airplanes flying across the sky? Who knows? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly do think that we are going to revisit the necessity of having face-to-face -face meetings as frequently as we used to. Um, I don't think they'll go away. I hope they won't go away because I do like to travel. and I do like to see people face to face, but I think we'll be more ju judicious. And so I think we'll see, even though that doesn't necessarily harbor well for the airline industry, I think we'll see a more deliberate pattern of behavior that before we were just reflexively thinking that we have to go call on a client instead of calling a client. That's an excellent way to put it. Well, folks, that's Stanley A. Holt, who is director of RENCI, the Renaissance Computing Institute at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm Michael Hekarainen, inviting you to find your own connection between the past and the future here in the present at the SC20 News Desk. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. You were a very gracious host.